I mean, let's face it, I, I, I really drew for yeah. black, illegitimate, gay, yeah. uh, <laughs> anything else. Hello, and welcome to The Third Act. I'm Catherine Fairweather, and the voice you just heard was the talented Mr. Bruce Oldfield. More of him in a minute. And this is the series where we bring you sparkling conversations with vintage minds. In each episode, I'll be sitting down with my guests for lunch in the sumptuous Calford's restaurant at Orion's Chelsea and discovering how they're redefining later living and very much embracing life's next act. And my guest today is someone who certainly isn't letting the grass grow under his feet. Bruce Oldfield has dressed royalty of all kinds, Hollywood, pop and the actual House of Windsor. From Princess Diana to Diana Ross and Rihanna, from Taylor Swift to Faye Dunaway, he has been trusted to design clothes that flatter figures, imbue glamour, elegance and grace. The couturier was born of mixed-race parents, an Irish mother and a Jamaican father whom he never met. His foster mother, Violet, encouraged his pleasure in sewing. Later, he was raised and educated by Bernardo's, the children's charity, and graduated from Central St. Martin's with flying colours. We sat down over lunch at the fabulous Culford's restaurant to catch up in the wake of a dramatic period of his life as he made the big move away from his beach and place empire. It's absolutely wonderful to see you. You look so unbelievably young. I wouldn't believe that you're 71. You look... In your 50s, honestly. I haven't seen you for about a year and a bit. Well, you know, they say black don't crack. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm sticking to that. You've had no facelifts, you say? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no a healthy not. lifestyle? Uh, no, actually, not really. No, no, no. I eat badly. That's for sure. I eat very badly. But I do quite a bit of exercise. I, I walk because I live opposite the park. So, and I have a dog. So, you know, we're in the park. Boom. Boo, boo, the border. So I'm in the park in the mornings, first thing, for 40 minutes, and then walk to work, that's 20 minutes. Walk back from work, that's another 20 minutes. And what do you put <laughs> on your face? Well, I don't Nothing. put anything on my face. No? No, no, no. no mystery cream, no secret? No, no. Um, I really, truly don't. It never occurs to me, you know, because I, every now and again, somebody says, says oh, you, look, you don't look your age, and so... I take a selfie and really study it closely and think, I, I look rubbish. I look, I said, uh, to me, I look all of my 70 years, 71 years. Are you a drinker? I don't drink. Have you never drunk? I drank like a fish. I drank <laughs> too much. I really did. I, I, I'm quite excessive, you see. I mean, so I'll, I can eat too much sugar. I can eat, I love ice cream. All of my friends know, you know, just... Just bring him a, just take him a couple of Hagen Dars and what stick him in the fridge. I like all that sort of salted caramel, you know, which I know is kind of a bit overdone these days, but I do, I do like it because I mean, it's just sugar on sugar. My doctor once said, you know, when, when, when they invented, when somebody realized that if you put sugar and fat together, they were onto a winner because <laughs> that's, that's it. You know, sugar and fat are just brilliant together, you know, bread and jam. You know, ice cream, that any, anything fat involved. Fat has to be involved. <laughs> so you were sort of Nigella type, you know, midnight muncher. No, no, I'm not a Nigella midnight muncher, bless her. I sleep a lot. I go to bed at about 10 and I read for half an hour and I, I'm asleep until 7. And I mean, you <laughs> are the ultimate... I suppose if we're talking about aging and how to age well, you under, you must understand better than anyone because you dress a lot of glamorous older women and you make them look better. What is the ingredient? That, maybe it's indefinable. Well, it's not indefinable in some cases. I mean, it's a question of you get right to the bottom of it all, you get to the base, and, and a good bra. <laughs> I mean, it's my it's my favorite thing to shame people into how many times they wash their bra and uh, it you know it, it's well, actually not the, great at it, don't they? no. And the funniest thing is, we had somebody come to pick up a dress this morning for her son's wedding. She was about sixty seven, sixty eight, nice figure, 
and she was wearing a sports bra. A sp- I mean, Catherine, <laughs> what is that all about? You don't wear a sports bra, particularly when, during the whole process of making this garment, we've said on a, a couple of occasions, for goodness sake, don't bring that bra again. You know, you must always, you must come with a bra which has got some structure to it. And, and that's the one you always wear, and that's the one you will wear on the day that you wear the dress. And she most certainly did not. So today I looked at her and I was thinking, goodness gracious me, that dress doesn't fit very well. And it was all around the bust, and um, anyway, we, she won't do that again. You gave her a... You gave her a <laughs> I gave her a, a real talking to, yeah. <laughs> and she says, where are you on Saturday? You know, I said, well, take it home. If there's any problem with it, you bring it back tomorrow. And will maybe you should do a whole line in underwear. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that is one thing. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's posture, isn't it? Standing up straight and and you know, bra. You know, the the worst thing is as the bosom gets bigger and grows lower, and the gap the gap narrows between your bust point and your waist. That's aging. So that's something you have to be careful of. Creating a creating a waste must be your challenge for the old. Yeah, people. yeah. I would say that twenty, thirty years ago. I mean, well, number one, I wouldn't be allowed to. It would have been considered deeply distasteful for me to bring up mention you know, your underwear. I mean, can you imagine fifty years ago, fifty-five years ago, Hartnell and that and those guys used to go in morning suit to the palace to do the fittings, you know. It was that formal. Can you imagine in those days that anything being said so untoward? These days, people want to look better. Yeah. You know. And they're happy for you to tell them how to look better. Yeah, especially women who are well-heeled. Everybody knows they can actually do something and something can be done. And they want it. They yeah. want a part of that. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they're amenable to being told that is straight talking, you know. And they have the and they they have the money, obviously, too. Yeah. To but it's not just about money, I suppose. No. It's also about understanding yourself well enough, having a sense of your own inner self, so that you don't look ridiculous. Because I mean, anything goes now. So, do you think people should dress in whatever style they want to dress as? Do you think that it should be that liberated, or do you think that uh, you should be dressed appropriately according to your age? Well, I just think that there are new parameters, aren't there, for an older woman to to look appropriate, you know. I mean, that's an interesting that's an interesting concept. This week, I threw out all my espadrilles, you know, the ones with the laces up the legs. Because I, yeah. I just thought, you know, I'm 57. I look, different look like a little girl. So I threw those away. Anything over the knees, although actually I think my knees are quite good. Well, then, if you think your knees are quite good, you should show them off. No, because I don't think, you know, you don't want to look like a little sort of fairy on a Christmas tree. No, you don't. No, I think, I think it's... I, I, I think that these days the, the, the thing that happens with women is, is certainly my clients, the older ones, they will say, oh, I can't show my arms, you know. Mm, go on, here we go. Um, <laughs> yes, let's have a look. Yeah. <laughs> let's have a look. They're fine. They're fine. You know, give them another four years. You've got four years worth of dresses to buy from me. We're it's terrifying going. I'm mean, terrifying nowhere. going into your own. No sleeves. No sleeves. Yeah. But, you, you know, it, it sort of doesn't matter anymore. There's a wonderful film that's doing the rounds of Aretha Franklin singing at a tribute to Carol King because Carol King is standing next to President Obama and, and Mrs. Obama. And this, anyway, Aretha comes in and she, she sings her song and she's fabulous. And she, she gets up and she, she's wearing this full-length mink coat. Off it comes and she's wearing sleeveless. And I think Aretha was younger than you thought when she died. She was only about 76. This film is about five years old, so she was 71. She was my age. And she took off this coat and she put her arms up and she had arms which went... Bat wings. <laughs> a, but, but huge, huge, huge. But it didn't matter. The whole, the whole auditorium got up and... and uh, she showed. had innate confidence and yeah, innate self-belief. Was, yeah, and it sort of didn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, well, what's the problem here, you know? 
But I, I, I can see that if you're not Aretha Franklin and you don't have that confidence, yeah, you so, might, might want to hide them. But, um, so self-confidence is the holy grail of glamour, self-confidence. Well, I think the epitome of glamour or the, 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 the basis of it is actually getting a handle on how you look and being, being confident about the things that, you, that really are good. And and just backing off on the ones that so Aretha really shouldn't have shown her. You know, it would have been better had she not. But but because she was who she is and she was the age that she was. But having said all that, you see, I'm quite confident, but I wouldn't go out with sleeveless. No, I mean, but uh, I'm quite conservative as well. And you you are, and you're quite conservative yeah, I'm, too. I'm yeah. stoked. So, so I think ju- that's just personality isn't it who else are your icons Charlotte Rampling was one of your icons were you inspired by her I loved well what I loved about Charlotte was that well I still do is that she was very 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 happy in herself you know in in the way she looked so she she wasn't a fashion person I, I fashion people scare me rigid you know I just don't want to be anywhere near them those people who spend all their time in fashion houses who are just Clothes horses. Hmm. They, uh, you know, so like you look at the Met ball and you just go, oh, oh, and oh, you go, oh, MG. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's, it's like a it's just an service. embarrassment. It's it an is. embarrassment. I think and, so. And, you know, when you, I, I noticed on Instagram people were putting up pictures of, from, of women in the past who used to go to the Met Gala, you know, people like, you know, in the same Pat Buckley and Bay Paley, all these women who, American socialites mainly, who were so elegant and so well-dressed. And this, this new lot, they either want to be drag queens or they will, I don't know. They're just exhibitionism, isn't it? Totally, that? yeah. But I would have thought after the couple of years we've had that it would all be toned down a bit more and people think to themselves... Is this appropriate in these times to be dressed like a sort of circus horse? So your icons probably are people who... Well, are my icons are people who, who are just not so interested in, in clothes. And Lauren Bacall is another one who I've met like three times in my life, but each time she remembered my name. Which is always good, um, but it just just the look of her, and she was the embodiment of elegance and grace and style. But she had quite a mouth on her as well, uh, yeah. which which which, which, which like. great, which I like. Uh, well, she was confident in herself, you know, yeah. in her own opinions, and which is kind of cool. So, Bruce, your life has changed quite a lot. It's been seismic times for you. Yeah, it? it's been great. So tell me what's happened. What's happened? Well, it, it, you know, business was, was slowing down with Brexit and everything. I mean, there, there, was, there was a good 15 months of slowdown. Because um, of Brexit? Because people were not, don't you remember? No. People were so uncertain about anything. Making just making oh, decisions. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. it really was yeah. a very, very funny time. That was even before the. That was before pandemic. the pandemic. Yeah. yeah, I would say about fifteen months before the pandemic, and we had, in spite of it all, we did have a very good year that year, twenty nineteen. But then it it was all getting a bit funny, you know. And where I was in Beecham Place, it was getting a bit tired and tatty. Beecham Place was a wonderful place to be because it. You know, it had good people there, good restaurants, and people used to make a, a beeline for it. You know, it was... But then it just got more and more and more... It, <laughs> be careful. It, you know, it became more and more... I, I tell you, it started up on um, Knightsbridge. You know, that raised part of Knightsbridge opposite Harrods, that became a sort of a little Bayswater... And then it moved down into, so it was more nail bars and shisha bars, and I mean, it just became a mess. And then the landlord put up the rent hugely. And, Why? Uh, because he got it. Yeah. And then we were told, of course, then along came COVID, and we were told that we, we had to close for basically three months. And so I just thought, nah, <laughs> time to go. Oh, I mean, that what? Because that was 40 years, it was your. 
home, your showroom, your mm. atelier, yeah. where you yeah. make yeah. everything, everything with yeah. the total nucleus. Of yes. Wow. So, did you sell all your beautiful? No, I didn't have time. I didn't have time. No, I put it into liquidation. I put it into voluntary liquidation. So it went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing went, and um, so all of my own personal things went into storage. And I moved. And and during that time, I sort of wrote to clients, emailed clients, and told them what was going on, and da 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 da, and. Uh, let me down. They were so kind, and 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 um, what I hadn't really taken into account was the goodwill, you know, and forty years of goodwill. I mean, I had clients who were buying things and paying for things that they didn't need to be paying for. That's extraordinary. You know what I mean? Like actually. one person said, um, "Okay, now actually, Bruce, I'm having my." Uh, because I made her wedding dress, so we're having our 10th wedding anniversary in 2022. And I need, can you, can you draw me up some evening dresses? Because we're having a big, big party and also something for my daughter. And I need some dinner dresses, so I may as well buy them all now. And, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what she did. Quite a bit of that went on. So people rallied around. And so you don't have a studio at all? No, oh, I do. No, so I moved in. I moved into a new flat in um, Prince of Wales Drive. How appropriate. And when we're just saying you should come here, this lovely Orin's, well, make, this, make this your club. Well, You can yeah. swim. You don't want to swim, you say. I don't want to swim. <laughs> and, yeah, and I found a studio down the, down the road from there. So my clients come to the flat. Or I go and visit them. And so I'm, I'm back to doing what I did ages and ages ago, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, where I, all I do is draw. I draw for the clients. I make a few samples, and I make samples of this, that, and the other, and then I do a lot of sketches of garments that employ that technique. So that if you don't understand the drawing, well, it's like this, dear, isn't it? So it's all, um, yeah, it, it's really good. And I, and, I, and I sit and I have my piano there and I have TV and, and do, I watch a lot of music. Music videos. Music videos on, um, on YouTube. I do that more than I watch anything. You don't watch films? I, I watch some on YouTube. I mean, it's great. All, they're all the black and white ones mm. from the 40s and 50s. Oh, God. So yeah. much more. Glamorous. Yeah, it was lovely, you know, because sometimes I think, oh, where did I get that idea from? Then I go, oh, yeah, there, uh, right. <laughs> you posted a wonderful music video the other day. Oh, Al Green. You know, um, me feel brand new, that one. Yes, yeah, do you remember that? Yeah. I wondered whether that was the soundtrack. It wasn't that you made me feel. No, the soundtrack to my life is, is that what you meant in yes. terms of music? Yes. It's, it's so, there is not one thing really. Because I've been very lucky. I was talking to somebody the other day that I've met in my life so many people. So, like, I don't know anybody who sat for a couple of hours with Marvin Gaye in Tram and talked to him when everybody else was off dancing. I don't know many people who have sat three times with Joni Mitchell. (laughs) So, Joni Mitchell, what was she like? Joni Mitchell was wonderful, you know, and I I know all the songs and I know all the words to the songs. And the the thing that amazes me, you see, is you say that I look young. I mean, Joni is only about four or five years older than me. So when I was chatting her up, she actually got to know me by the time we'd finished. You know, I would have been 25 and she would have been 31. You know, so we were both young. We were both the the same age, Mm. practically. And it's it's just funny. I mean, you, you look at people and... Funnily enough, they gain age by fame. Mm, you know, you right. think they're... They, they seem taller and older and somehow that's, what's, yeah. that's what fame does to you. Yeah. It? But you were a famous in your own right, weren't you? Even then you were... Well, well I, yeah, I'd, I'd been noticed, to me say. So it's, it's not <laughs> really surprising that you were having sort of sitting next to Marvin Gaye because... Everyone moves around in those circles when you've achieved a certain level of, of celebrity or success. Yeah, I guess. In fact, I was going to come back. I was going to ask you about success. Is talent what it is? Or is there something else in your nature that enabled you to break those social barriers? Well, I mean, I, 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 I think, yes. I mean, I think for certain I thought that I was something great. 
did you do? <laughs> self belief. Self belief. Yeah. Wow. I, I didn't think I was great, but I thought, that, which I wasn't anyway. But I, I, I did think that I was worth a listen to. Even you know when you were really young. Yes. Because. Yes, I did. Because I, I remember. A lot of things happened to me when I was very young, when, you know, with Bernardo's and being with a foster mother and then being in a branch home with Bernardo's. I was always very aware of people around me who were guiding me, forcing me into things that I didn't necessarily want to do. And with no rhyme or reason, except that perhaps somebody has said, oh, he needs his ask. He's an arrogant little twat. Move him to... And that move would be affected because I... I couldn't do anything about it. You know what I mean? But but then there are certain demands that I, I began to make, you know, like, well, I passed my 11 plus. So I I was due for a, for a seat at the grammar school table. And I... Uh, and You had ambition. I had ambition. And I couldn't sit here and say that I forced the issue, but I, I certainly made what, what, you know, what was my right... Yeah, and there was no one be behind you encouraging you particularly. Your Violet, your foster mother. No, she wasn't around then. She wasn't around then, was she? So it's that innate sense of uh, self and, and, and refusal to be stereotyped as well. Oh, right? refu- well, most certainly a refusal to be stereotyped. Yeah. As, as anything, you know, black. I mean, let's face it, I, I, I really drew <laughs> the, the poor, yeah, yeah. black. Illegitimate, gay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anything else? Can you? Yeah. It, you Absolutely. Know, it, um, all of those. All of those things. I was. You you broke all the all the social barriers. The oh, I certainly wasn't going to be in any way judged by those those criteria. You know, the no. criteria, you, know you judge by your talent, by my talent, and your my, personality. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, and that's still how you feel, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but this was the 60s and 70s, wasn't it? But when, when social boundaries were, were being busted. Oh, yeah. Do you think it's easier for people today? Now, we, you know, we've had the Me Too movement. We've had Black Lives Matter. Do you think those are important? Or do you think that society is more rigid than it was back then? I, I certainly have noticed that I'm, I'm becoming rapidly a, a black eye. <laughs> A black icon, <laughs> which you never asked for. I never asked for. Elton John told me a long, long time ago, he said, no, well, don't invite him because, me, don't invite me because he doesn't like gay people. You know, it's not a question of me not liking gay people. It's just that I don't want to be... Uh, labelled. Uh, labelled, you know, it's mm. not necessary. I, I say that I'm gay. I, I don't care. It's not, it's not a problem for me. But I don't, you know, I'm not going to be running around carrying a, a flag. <laughs> I, I think that people expect to be listened to for every little difference that they can find, difference from the norm, any deviation from the norm, any deviation sounds negative, any, any difference from the norm. I mean, I suppose what we're talking about is really is, is minority voices, and that's... Everyone should have a should have a voice, shouldn't they? They didn't before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose they should, if you say so. <laughs> but funnily enough, talking about people over a certain age, I still think that there isn't enough of a voice for for older people, people in later life, even though they're not a minority. People over fifty are make up the majority of the population, yeah. and yet somehow. They're sidelined. Um, there are not enough great parts for older women, for instance. No. Acting parts. Older fashion. Fashion for older women. Um, fashion no. for older men. No. So I think it's important that the, I think maybe the, the last taboo is ageism. I think, you, I think you're probably right, actually. Because you know, certainly I've gone the full gamut of dressing people, you know. I mean, I, I, mean I, I do dress brides and I dress their mothers and indeed I dress their grandmothers. And that is within even just, even just my age, you know. I'm 71, so 
I could you divide it by three, don't you? So I could have I could have a a granddaughter. So what next? What do, are you still traveling? Are you still interested? I know you've been rather ill, and now you're better. Oh yeah, I know. I'm 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 fine. I mean, my illness was was. Um, you had the dreaded C word. I had it twice. Wow. <laughs> so did that bring you up against a sense of your own well, obviously, mortality? Your own mortality yeah. And did that change the way you do things? It most certainly did. Well, the first time it, I was fifty, I was forty-eight. And that got me into taking houses in the country. I rent. I, I always rent things. I don't buy things. I rent. Um, I'm, I'm the only person in England who rents and is quite happy. Time. Quite happy. Yes. It, it prompted me to get a dog, get a house in the country. And I was, it was a beautiful house. You know, I, I stayed there a couple of years and then moved on and then came back. And then it's a bit lonely when you're on your own. That's the, the worst thing about getting old is, is the is being on your own. Yeah. But because I've rediscovered my twenty something self, this business of being able to, you know, sit and cook something, then go from the kitchen to the drawing room, sit in front of my screen and draw and maybe listen to the radio or listen listen to some music on it was you, you know, it's like you fill the time very, very easily. You know, it's not a, it's not a. But was it your be, being ill that made you rediscover your twenty-one-year-old self, your student self? No, just being lonely. <laughs> Isn't that sad? <laughs> but you have to deal. You have so many friends, to... Bruce. Uh, but you can still be lonely, I know. Uh, yeah, friends. but I don't. Yeah, but no, I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel lonely because I fill. I fill my fill time. Your time, and I have my dog, and I. I do have friends. There are people coming around, like somebody's coming around tomorrow night, and and they said, "No, don't cook." And I said, "Well, actually, what the fuck do you think I'm going to do with you for three hours if I don't cook? You, you're not that interesting." You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, um, but that sense of loneliness. Do you think it increases as you get older? I mean, did you feel it when you were younger? Yes. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, I've always felt it. Um, but I think that's Bernardo more than anything else. Really? Yeah. Yes. Not having parents. Not having parents. Not yeah. being wanted. I mean, I know it's really sad, but it's true. But you just have to. Re- you just have to look at the. There must have been people in your in who passed through your life who fell madly in love with you, Bruce. Many have fallen in love with me, yeah. but I haven't fallen in love with anybody. Is that because you are just wary? I'm not of... used to doing. It. I don't know how to do it. Is that your dogs? You follow them. Your I dogs. follow them. Your, dogs, your yeah, dogs. Yeah, they're are... easy. Yeah, because they they're a great company. And they give do you, you that. Do you never trust your... anyone? Do you not trust even your friends? You must have trusted your loyalties and your. Well, you just said to me your your clients came back. Yeah. showing great loyalty to you, and you yeah. were astounded. That and, they did. and yes, yes, and I think that people. Yeah, I think I'm just probably just a difficult past. <laughs> you know. yeah, but I do not. think that a lot of it is. You know, the, the whole Bernardo's. I, I do blame a, a lot of it on that. I, I never used to. It never used to occur to me, actually. But I think it is that. You know, people say that you know, children, children who um, who are not with their, you know, because let's face it. You know, I was taken from my mother at birth and put into Great Ormond Street Hospital Nursery. Absolutely. And then down, and I lived in nurseries until I was 18 months old. I know, it's extraordinary. And to me, you are extraordinary because you have, you exude great warmth, actually. And you make people feel good about themselves through the clothes that you create for them. And and so that's because you, you weren't taught love as a baby. And, and that is the, so... It's I'm gonna cry. From, so it's coming from somewhere. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's not. Um, it's it's innate in you. It's innate, uh, yeah. and it wasn't taught. So, did you ever? Did you ever see? Actually, out of interest, did you? Did you get to an age um, like your fifties? I think it ha- often happens in your fifties, middle age, where you suddenly think, keep repeating bad patterns, and maybe I should see a shrink because I want I want to, to know if this mm. lack of love affected me. Did you ever see a shrink or not? Yeah, once. 
Only it once. It was a total disaster. Okay. And I said to him, well, look, um, I'll tell you what, I'll bring you round my autobiography because that will help fill in some of the gaps. <laughs> it, sort of, it doesn't really work like that, Bruce. And I said, no, I don't think it's going to work anyway, actually. Do you think you have um, other, I mean, you, you do what you do so brilliantly, but sometimes I wonder whether you wouldn't make an absolutely brilliant gardener or florist because you seem to know so much about um, I love gardening. Plants I love plants. I love flowers. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm very, very, yes, I am. I would, perhaps. <laughs> that could be an alternative. <laughs> it could be. No, but I, 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 I would still like to continue doing this for another 10 years, you know. I mean, when you think, I mean, Giorgio Armani is 88. He's 88. Must be. 16 oh. years older than me, so 87. Could you, you know, Oscar, for a all very those people. Long time. Well, they do, especially the very successful ones, because they. Um, yeah, why do they? Because they're doing what they love doing. And they're very rich, <laughs> and they're very pampered, and they they get to a point where they're not really doing an awful lot. You know, they are the uh, the head of the house, and they are the image of the house, but they're not actually physically working. They're just putting in their they're, two pennies every now and again. They get head. Yeah. Totem. Well, we're just about to have a very delicious lunch. Ooh. Let's talk about last suppers. What would you have for your last supper? Chicken. <laughs> this is what you're having for lunch. Yeah. No, I'm actually quite keen on becoming a vegetarian because I, I am such a sop, soppy date. This is my fossil memory. You're yeah, such a soppy date. Yes, dear. Um, I, I don't like killing things. It's quite like eating them. I quite like eating them, but I could easily not. You'll become more and more ascetic. You'll become more and more monk-like. You've given up drinking and smoking and you've given up. You will give up eating meat and gradually you'll give up, shed all your books and your clothes and, and you'll end well, up. I've already gotten rid of most of those. You'll end up in a, in a cashmere. Yes. It's been such a delight and a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, darling. And, and I look forward to the next 20 years, maybe another lunch here Week. 20 years. As we just said, yeah. curios go on forever. You'll be there. And centenarians, yeah. there are more centenarians now than there ever have been. So you'll be toasting your 100th birthday again. Yeah, what do you think? It's been yeah. a delight. It's been Thank you so much. Thank you. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can hear more episodes in the series by clicking follow wherever you're listening to this or simply searching The Third Act on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. And if you think your friends would love to listen, please do tell them about us. This episode was produced by Pete Norton and made possible by Orion's, luxurious residences that are redefining later living in the heart of Chelsea. I'm Catherine Fairweather, and I can't wait to join you next week for The Third Act.